We are in Mark chapter 4. We're going to be dealing with verses 21 through 25. Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 25. How is your lamp? How is your lamp? Charles Spurgeon, preaching on Matthew chapter 5, said, quote, The Bible is not the light of the world. It is the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. You are the light of the world. Christians are supposed to be lamps who shine forth light. So the world will see and know the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is in them. And we learned in verse 13, which is uh, the the very first verse to be connected with this passage we're going to deal with today. The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, Do you not understand this parable, meaning the parable of the sower? How then will you understand all the parables? Really, how are we to understand this parable, the parable of the lamp on a stand, unless we understand the previous parable? So the parable of the sower and the parable of the lamp are are to be seen as connected stories. They they go together because our Lord Jesus Christ means to teach us the same thing. Both have been masterfully presented by Jesus to make a divine truth clear. That's the purpose of a parable. That's what a parable is. Placing one thing alongside of another in order to make a divine truth clear. So the question is, what does being good soil and what does being light look like? What does that look like? Jesus essentially says with this parable, the parable of the lamp on a stand. He says here, let me give you another parable so you can learn the answer to this question. And this is what we want to do today. Both parables teach us about the responsibility that we have as Christ followers. True believers are the good soil. And as good soil, we are planted. We take root. We grow. We reseed. We spread. That's what it means to be good soil. We can also be seen as lamps. And as lamps, we are to shine the light of Jesus in our life. And as lamps, there are several things that ought to be evident. Number one, as lamps, we are expected to shine. We are expected to shine. Verse 21, and he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? and not on a stand? Now, several months ago, we had the, it was a good time, where we had the church gathered together at our house. And, uh, and we had a bonfire. And Calvary Connections put this bonfire together for us. And, um, and, and we, we, had, uh, we had funnel cake. Highlight. We, and, we had, uh, and we had s'mores. And we had the bonfire... And even though the bonfire gives off light itself, where we had the goodies to be assembled in order to make the s'mores, it was rather dark, and we couldn't tell if we were putting crickets on a marshmallow and stuffing that in the fire, or if we had the real thing going on. So we needed a lamp. Now, Thankfully, this was unearthed in the Holy Lands, and uh, it's periods... No, I'm just kidding. This is a lamp of sorts. The real lamp would have been shaped very differently, probably made of clay, would have had a a kind of a spout with a handle on the end where you could put fuel inside and a wick that comes out of the mouth of that, and that would have been a lamp to illumine a space. And the Lord is using the parable saying, listen, do you put that lamp down here or, or do you take a lamp and put it on a stand so that that illumination will shine forth and fill the room? That's what is in view here. Now listen, we, we had this lamp that I found. And you know what? It's very simple. I expected that thing to shine. I, expect, I had a very simple expectation. I wanted to be able to see the s'more components, and I wanted all of you to be confident that, that what we told you was on that table was actually there, and that you could see those, those components, the skewers, the marshmallows, the chocolate. Listen, if there's no light, then we can't see what we're, what we're doing. My expectation was simple. I wanted the lamp to, to shine that light in the night so that people could see what they were doing. 
Jesus asks this question, verse 21, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? We have to understand some biblical truth here as it, as it involves illustrations. First in Scripture, light is used as an object lesson for many things. Light is used as an object lesson to teach us about Jesus himself who is the light who came into the world. Jesus is the light. Light can be used to, to describe and help us to understand divine truth. We have the light of God's Word. Light can also be used to describe holiness, that we should be living lives in conformity with God's Word, and in that way, we can, we can equate that with light. We can describe light as the gospel message. The truth of God's Word is the light. Our spiritual lives in Christ can be described as light. So, so in the Bible, we see that, that light can be described in many different ways. Listen, the lamp in view, that lamp, that lamp in this parable, Christians, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are that lamp. You are that lamp and you are expected to shine forth the light of God's truth. Jesus does not want us to hide the miracle of what he has done in our lives. That's why we are to shine. Not so that people can see you and say, good job, but so that people can see what has happened in your life and the transformative work of the Holy Spirit of God and can say, praise God, I want him. Also notice that the lamp is brought in. Is a lamp brought in? Stop. It's not a light that we create for ourselves. This light is not a light that we create for ourselves. It's light that God graciously brings. He or she who is lit by the Spirit of God is lit by the Spirit of God who is the lighter of the light. We don't light the light ourselves. Just like an oil lamp, it's, it's not brought in only to be put under a basket and covered up. Now, in view would have been uh, a, a peck measurement, sort of a covering up of, the, of the, the mouth of that lamp where the wick would have been. And so to cover that up would have been to snuff out, remove all oxygen, and that lamp goes out pretty quickly. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying, listen, do you put a basket, do you put that little peck measurement of a covering over the mouth of that lamp? No, you don't do that. Because now you're going to snuff out the light. You allow that to shine forth, and you put it up high. You don't put it under a bed, because if you do that, it's down low. And, and it's, that illumination is not going to shine forth to the rest of the room. You've got to put it up high. Besides, you put it under the bed, you're going to catch the bed on fire. Just saying. So it's a very simple lesson that we have from the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the light. The lamp is meant to be put in a place where the light shines clearly and fills the room. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5, that, that passage of Scripture that Charles Spurgeon preached on, uh, which is the, the quote that I read for you earlier about Christians being that light who shine forth, that we are the light of the world. The world reads Christians. The world reads Christians. Now listen to what uh, the Lord says in Matthew chapter 5, he's talking about salt and light. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now listen, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, here's the lesson, listen, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, and listen, give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's the why. People need to see the light so they can glorify God. Not you. We who are his followers, so then what does this look like? We love Him. They should see your love for Him. We obey Him. They should see our obedience to Him. 
and we hold forth the light of truth to the people around us, they should know that we have an adoration for God's Word. That's what it means to shine forth as light. God shines His revealed truth in this dark world through His Word and through the testimony of our lives. This is the analogy. Just as if a little household oil lamp is brought into a dark room, our lights of truth shine forth the Word. So I have a question. How can we understand the importance of being light? How can we understand that? Well, listen, very simple. Let Jesus, who is on the inside, be seen on the outside. Let Jesus, who is on the inside, who has taken up residence in our hearts, be seen on the outside. You know that I'm a, uh, I, I believe in, in assessment. So how about a silent self-assessment? Let's assess. Is your light hidden or is it on a stand? Consider these questions. Can people see God's righteousness in my life? This is a personal question. You, th- you think and you honestly self-reflect. Do I seek to obey Him? Do others see the consistency of my obedience? Am I unashamed of my life in Christ among my non-believing friends, my non-believing co-workers, my non-believing neighbors? If you can say yes to that, your light is on a stand. If your answer is no, your light's under the bed or it's under a basket. Get it out. Pull it out and put it up high. Let others see Jesus Christ in you by your obedience. Let them see Jesus Christ in you because of your righteous living. Let, let them see Jesus Christ in you because of, of your understanding of how you ought to live and your adoration for God's Word. Let the Lord Jesus Christ be seen in you, illumined for Him. Another package of questions for your honest self-assessment. Am I scared that people will laugh at my faith? Think about your workplace. Think about school, if you go to a school, whether that be a public school, a private school, homeschool among your your siblings. Am I scared that people will laugh at my faith? Am I concerned that because of my faith in Christ that people will perceive me as weak or perhaps even nerdy? Am I secretive about the truth because of society's hostility against Christianity? Do I try to fit in with my classmates at school or blend in with my coworkers? Do I laugh with non-believers when I shouldn't be laughing? If your answer is no, that's a good answer. Your light may be on that stand. If your answer is yes to those questions, you're putting your light under a basket or under the bed. Pull it out and put it up high. You see? This is an honest self-assessment. Think about this. Think about these things. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I see that these two passages... So we are sword drilling. I didn't mark them. So we're sword drilling together right now, folks. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now listen, that does not mean to go stand up yourself on a pedestal. Though it could be this, but this is not what it means to say as you curse the darkness. That's not what it's saying. The exposure of darkness is because of the light of your testimony. Allow your testimony to be that light. You don't have to work hard to expose it by screaming at the top of your lungs about how dark your coworkers are. They will see the light because of your natural behavior. Organically, as, you're, as you live your life, there will be something different. And they will ask you where that comes from. I've had this happen many times over, usually while I'm doing lunch duty in the midst of 300 plus people. 
People come up, my, my, my colleagues come up and they want to know about this religion thing. What do you mean by this religion thing? Well, you're a priest. No, I'm not. <laughs> do you want to know the difference between a pastor and a priest? I'll tell you. <laughs> so listen, people will naturally ask questions if they can see that there's something that distinguishes you from the world. You follow me? James chapter 1, verse 27. James chapter 1, verse 27. Right before 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 27. I got you again. I got there before you did. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Listen, listen, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I have a bunch of black walnut trees over on our property. Man, those black walnut nuts, when they fall, are an absolute staining mess. They'll stain your fingers. They'll, they'll stain the, the, the asphalt. I mean, they just, they stain, they stain, they stain. That's the kind of stain that the world does to you when you mingle together with them. Don't allow yourself to be stained by the world. Remain pure and undefiled, just like James tells us to do. Why? Because if you get stained, they're not going to see the light. It's going to dull the light. And then there's compromise. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Remember, he said this, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As a lamp, listen, point number one, we are expected to shine. I expected that thing. When I went to it and began to prepare, I expected that it would shine. We are expected as believers in Jesus Christ to shine. Our good deeds are that light that God uses to cause others to give Him glory and to praise Him. Very simple. Let your light shine. Really, we can capture this with one very simple statement. So if you're listening, children, listen to this. Here it is. Let the light, let the light of Jesus shine within you. Very good. Let the light of Jesus shine in you. Pretty soon I'm going to be walking all the way to the back screen so that I can... But I'm not ready for glasses. I can still hit a softball, by the way. So if you want to come and watch a softball game tomorrow night, we're, uh, we're going to be playing down at Pinebrook. And you can see our softball team consisting of uh, several old men like myself trying to squint to see the ball as it comes in. As lamps for Jesus, we are expected to shine. And number two, we are expected to reveal hidden truth. We are expected to reveal hidden truth. Verse 22, For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Once again, at the church bonfire, I did get that camping lantern to light. I expected that it would shine. And so I did what was necessary. I took those necessary, pre, uh, those necessary steps in order to get this thing to light. And so now we could see what was hidden in the dark. We could, see, we could see the marshmallows. We could see the graham crackers. We could see the chocolate. And we could see the plates on which to put these things. We could see the skewers. All those things uh, that, uh, that, that were hidden in the dark became illuminated. And now we could see what we were doing. That's what lamps do. They are intended to illumine dark places, to bring things that are hidden, that are in the dark, out and into the light. That's what a lamp does, to reveal hidden truth. The word secret here, for nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret, secret, musterion from the Greek, can also be translated mystery, something that is not properly or clearly understood. This is what is, is, is meant here in this verse. It refers to God's truth that was previously hidden, but now has been revealed. Before Jesus came, the kingdom of God was rather unclear to the human finite mind. We had Old Testament prophecy, 
But man's ability to comprehend that was not clear, was not comprehensive, it was not full, it was not complete. His ability to interpret was limited. Then Jesus came and he made the secret of the kingdom of God become more clear and understandable. It's kind of like the secrets of the universe, right? We can't really understand all that is meant to be understood in the universe. There's a lot out there that we just don't grasp it. It's a vast, limitless, endless, it seems, universe. But as observation and as scientific discovery uh, reveals more and more of, of what is mysterious, it becomes better known. You see? And in this way, with Christians, Jesus came and, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And we are, are part of that kingdom, that family of God. And we are, are agents of truth. And people can come to a better understanding of the truth. Hopefully, if you're not compromising it, by observing you who are lights who shine forth in this world. Do, lam- do lamps expose darkness or do lamps express light? Hmm. Do lamps expose darkness or do lamps express light? As part of my history degree, I had to take philosophy courses. These are the kinds of things we would sit around and talk about for hours. Like, just that question. But lamps express light, and therefore they reveal the, the, what is in the room because of the darkness. Lamps express light. So, as lamp lights, believers don't need to try to expose the darkness. Believers naturally illumine, and the darkness becomes evident. It's there. Because now it's being illuminated. So you can see that. As we live for God and as we preach His Word and as we present the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the truth is what naturally exposes sin. It's the truth. As a lamp of God, we bring His truth to light. As a lamp of God, we bring His truth to light. We are to help others understand the Gospel. By preaching and presenting the good news, God's plan of salvation is brought to light. It becomes clear. When people ask questions because they see something that just distinguishes you from every other person in the world, that's your invitation. That's your invitation to share the truth. That's your invitation to, to take, to take this, uh, this lamp that has been primed in and just crank that thing up to high. Light and darkness are contrasts. They don't blend. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? As lamps for Christ, we shine as lights of truth, which should contrast with the darkness of our secular culture. So as lamps for Jesus, we've learned that We are, just like a lamp, expected to shine. We are to reveal hidden truth, just like a lamp burns bright and we can see what's in the darkness. As lamps for Jesus, we also, understand this, need fuel to burn. We need fuel to burn. Now, verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 24, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. Now, you might be wondering, you've stretched it now, Pastor. You've stretched it now. We were, we were talking about lamps. Now we're talking, and that has to do with sight lines. And, and now we're talking about hearing, and, and you're still going to make the connection to the lamp? Ah, yes. Listen, the lamp has to do with seeing, as you've correctly argued in your head. Now, hearing... This is all connected. It goes together. Like I said, we, I had Bob read this, this passage. We, we've also got the, the act of, of sowing. So we've got sowing. We've got the farmer. We've got the seed. We've got different kinds of ground. We've, we've got now a lamp and, and down low versus up high and shining forth and, and illuminating. Luke chapter 8, verse 18. Take care then how you hear. 
For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. This lamp doesn't operate unless you open up this reservoir right here and you've got to pour fuel into that reservoir. If it has fuel, it's going to illumine these wicks and it's going to burn. And that burning is, uh, is only possible if the fuel is present, providing the opportunity for that wick to burn. So at the church bonfire, that, that lantern needed fuel. I put fuel in it. Likewise, Christians need fuel in order to burn for Jesus Christ. What's the fuel then? What's the fuel? The Christian's fuel is the Word of God. The Christian's fuel is the Word of God. Two lessons. I'm going to take Mark chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, and, and the parallel reference of Luke chapter 8, verse 18, to understand and, and prove to us all that, that it is important what we hear and how we hear. It is important what we hear. Mark chapter 4, verse 23. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to, listen, what you hear. It is important that we listen to those who teach God's word clearly and faithfully. Here at Calvary Bible Church, we have many opportunities to hear the word of God clearly and succinctly. I walk down into Mayvale Hall again in the midst of the busyness and running around, and I hear once again the, the Bible is being taught by our Sunday school teacher there. And I walk through the lower education wing, and I can hear the, the Sunday school lessons that are going along, going, going around. And I go into the upper education wing, the, the kids, the little kids, and they're coming in here and they're learning songs. Listen, you have ample opportunity. Calvary School of the Bible is meeting at 3.30 tonight for our fourth and final session of Methods and Teaching with, with uh, Cindy and myself. Uh, we're, we're meeting at 3.30 to 5 o'clock. And then next week, uh, at regular time, 4 o'clock until 5.30, we, uh, we have Calvary School of the Bible again. There are ample opportunities for us to be immersed in the Word of God. We are Calvary Bible Church. Bible. Bible. This is the fuel I think so often we go and we look for the fuel in other locations. Listen, the government may be in love with alternative fuels. There's no alternative fuel here. This is the fuel. There's no alternative to this fuel. We should also read books and articles and listen to podcasts that explain God's truth accurately. But listen... You can get so derailed and your, your wheels on, on your train could come so clearly off the tracks if you don't first know the Word of God to be able to discern the truth from the error. Because there's plenty of error out there. You have to be a discerning listener. You have to be a discerning reader to know if what you are getting into is accurate. This is why he says, pay close attention to what we hear. We should not listen to just anyone. You should be picky about who you listen to. Be picky. And if it makes you a little bit uneasy, they, they say something here and say something there, and maybe it's time to move on to somebody else. Seek out Bible study opportunities where you can discuss God's Word with others. Listen, above all else, you can't go wrong. Just actually read the Word. Just actually read it. And pay close attention to what God's Word says. Luke chapter 8, verse 18 says, Take care then how. What you hear is important. Dr. Luke says how you hear it is also important. How you hear it is important. Guys, be honest with me. Honest self-assessment. How you hear is very important. Have you ever struggled with how you have heard something that your wife says to you? I know you struggle with what you hear. 
But have you ever struggled with how you've heard it? Did you hear it as criticism instead of a question? Did you hear it as an attack instead of a mere comment? How you hear is very important, and I can attest to this truth. We need to pay attention to what God is actually saying. Listen, not what we want His Word to say. We pay attention to what God's Word is actually saying, not what we want His Word to say. It is so easy in in the busyness and in the affairs of our lives to twist and turn His Word to suit our purposes. Don't do that. If we're going to receive the Word of God diligently and reverently, Listen, a couple things need to happen. Number one, we have to be careful to address the sin and the distraction in our own hearts and in our lives that prevent us from hearing God's Word clearly. Number two, we have to go to the Lord prayerfully and ask Him. So often I pray for the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit for myself first before I ever come and ask for it for you. We want... God's word to be understandable to us and ask him to instruct us. Let me tell you a a big danger for those of us who have been in the church for a, a number of years, and perhaps you can count the decades you've been attending this particular church. The, a very dangerous thing for you to say as we gather together for worship and you hear God's word preached, either by me or or someone else who who takes this pulpit. I've heard all this before. That's a dangerous thing to say. I've heard all this before because I think there's a real danger when we mentally check out. I think there's also a real danger when we mentally check out because I've heard all this before and you start thinking about all the applications that apply to everybody else except to you. Really, you should be thinking about how this applies to me and how this should affect meaningful change in me to alter the relationships that you have with your spouses, to alter the relationships you have with your kids, to alter the relationships you have with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, to alter the relationships you have with your non-believing co-workers. Think about personal application, not application for everybody else out there who needs to hear this because I've heard all this before. There's something to be said about eating food versus eating ideas. People seem to be way more careful with their stomachs than they are with their heads. Hand something to someone and invite them to eat it. If they're unfamiliar with that thing, (laughs) what is it? Taste it and find out. I just spent two and a half hours making it. (laughs) Okay. Oh, that's good. I told you it was good. My wife made it. She's not yet made anything bad. People are very careful about what they eat. Not so careful, food-wise, not so careful about their consumption of ideas. That's a different story. We are consumers of media. We are consumers of media. And media bombards us with ideas, and not all of those ideas are good. In fact, many, most, are bad. We need to be very careful about what we eat, of course, but we should take great care about what we see, about what we hear, We need to make sure that it agrees with God's revealed truth. I like some reality shows about people who are existing in the wilderness. One is a show called Alone by the History Channel. And I actually stayed in one of the contestants' homes because he was at the time a missionary in Brazil. And so I knew the contestant who won season two. I knew of him. I didn't know him. Cindy grew up with his wife on the mission field. And, um, and he won season two of Alone. So I, that alone got us kind of interested in the show. This year, 
they, they put out a uh, spinoff on the show, and it was called Alone Frozen. And so they dropped them in, uh, off the coast of Labrador, way up in, uh, in Canada, near the Arctic. And it gets cold. And they dropped them off right before wintertime. So they had to find shelter. They had to find a fresh water supply. They had to find food, right? And um, you know what I have seen? What we, what really uh, we started to see was, was people who were very uh, capable, but every time they, they realized some success, either in procuring food or finding fresh water or getting their shelter, especially where it involves food, thank you, squirrel, for giving your life. Thank you, land, for giving me berries. Thank you, sea, for giving me fish. Oh, God, Please let me get this grouse. And then after the grouse has been shot with, a, with a, um, um, a recurve bow, which is not easy to do, and then after that grouse is shot, and after that person has cried out, please help me God to get this food, I need this food, thank you grouse for giving me your life. What about thank you Jehovah Jireh for being the great provider? Listen, this is... This is what I'm talking about. You've got to be very careful about what you hear and and how you hear. You've got to be able to discern the truth from the error. If you hear that kind of stuff, does that that grate at you a little bit? Could you see the error in all of that? Could you see the worship of creation? Or, Or rather, the worship of the creature rather than creation, which is spoken of in Romans chapter 1. Let's go there for a moment. Romans, what, what I witnessed was Romans chapter 1 on display. My mind immediately went to this passage. Romans chapter 1, verse 22. We know the wrath, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Skip down to verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Verse 25, Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Every single one of those comments comes from someone who doesn't know the truth of who the Creator actually is, the very person who is responsible for those creatures who he said, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Thank you, squirrel. Forget That squirrel doesn't want to be thanked by you. That squirrel is very dead and it can't hear you. <laughs> Listen, it's lunacy if you stop and you think about it. It really is. But it's exactly what God is warning against. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as he wrote. This is what we are seeing in our society. Can you discern the truth from the error? That's the question. Lamps need fuel to burn. Our fuel is the Word. Make sure you know the Word so you can detect the error. Christians need the fuel of God's Word so they can be wise and discerning defenders of the truth. So as lamps for Jesus, we are expected to shine. I expected that thing to shine. As lamps for Jesus, we reveal hidden truth. That light from that lamp revealed what was in the darkness. We need fuel, and the fuel is the Word of God, just as that lamp needs fuel in order to burn its light. As lamps for Jesus, we also, and we'll close with this, number four, we burn brighter with time, or at least we should. We are to burn brighter with time. Verse 24. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I wanted this lamp to be able to burn brighter. It seemed to have been dimming. I think maybe the dial may have been kind of floating back like this. And also, I had primed it, which was necessary, and and it needed to be reprimed. And the fuel that I had added, I needed to make sure that it was clean because the cleaner the fuel, the brighter the burn. 
And if it needs to be reprimed, then, then you're going to get more pressure in that tank and you're going to get a brighter burn with the lamp. So all those factors had to be taken into consideration. The bottom line was, I want you to burn brighter, I said to the lamp who couldn't hear me. And so those were some of the steps I needed to take. Now look at verse 24, the tail end of it. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. There's an old saying, you get out what you put in. You get out what you put in. And so the question is, what are you putting in? There's a sense of responsibility among believers in Jesus Christ. You have to make an investment. Invest in knowing the truth. If you're not good soil, then the seed doesn't take root. If you are good soil, the seed takes root and grows according to the quality of the nourishment that it receives. Likewise, if your lamp is lit, the quality of the illumination is dependent upon the pressure that's in the tank, and it's dependent upon the quality of the fuel. You want to make sure there's no water in there to taint the fuel. The Christian's light burns brighter with the quality of fuel that it has. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Right, Commander Ian? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Verse 25, For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. All right, let's dive into this. We could say that there are two kinds of having. Look at the word. Has. 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 Three times. Two kinds of having. There's the kind of having where we merely possess it. By God's grace, His Word has been preserved down through the ages. We have it, meaning we possess copies of God's Word. Right? So there's the the mere possession of God's Word. That's what it means to have it. We also have commentaries. We have lexicons. We have Bible dictionaries. We uh, We have thoughtful preachers who are consistent with uh, the, the theology that we lock on to. So we have these things. It's in our possession. But then there's the kind of having where you don't just possess it. You actually cherish it. That's the kind of having that the Lord is speaking of here. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. That's the has that we're speaking to. You, you have it, you don't merely possess it, you cherish it. You love it. You don't treat it as another collection of things that you have on the shelf. It's, it's the source. It's a deeper sense of possession. We gratefully, we thoughtfully, we reverently own His truth. In this way, we don't just have it, we see it's a measurable value And because of that immeasurable value, we are willing to protect it. And when those would want to to destroy it, we want to stand firm and get in the way and protect it. We cherish it. So allow His truth to reach down deep and change who we are and the way we live. For to the one who has, more will be given. What's more? What is more? More money? More material possessions? No, that's a different gospel. That's a prosperity gospel that concludes that you'll have more material blessing. That's not what this is. You want, an, you want real blessing? You want eternal blessing? Not the temporal kind? What he means to say is, For the one who has, more will be given. More desire to hear. More desire to understand. More desire to to love Him. Naturally. More desire to love others. More peace in the midst of a chaotic world. More, more contentment despite your circumstances. That's the more he's talking about. More will be given to you. More blessings of the eternal kind. That. Those are results. 
That's the kind of having. Also, verse 25, there are those also who are exposed to the truth, but there was no transformation. They went out from us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they would have remained with us. 1 John. Those who remain, those who abide, are those who have, have heard the truth. Their lamp light has been lit by the Holy Spirit of God unto salvation. And they are burning, and they continue to burn because it was real, it was genuine, it was authentic. There are those who hear, but it's with them for just the time. It's kind of like that seed that drops on the pathway that's been matted down or that seed that's been among the stones, or it's that seed that is among the thorns. It's there for a time, but eventually, either birds are going to come and snatch it away, or it's going to wither and die because the, the uh, root system is too shallow. In other words, it was, they were never lit to begin with. You don't want to be that person. The word they do here never really affects any sort of a change. It may have been very temporal. They populate churches. They hear the word. But they're hearing critically. They're going to be critical of the pastor who's preaching. They're going to be critical of the word that they hear because they're not hearing it in the right way. That speaks to the how you hear. They're going to be gossips. They're going to be sowers of discord. They're going to be unloving towards others. That's the difference between being light or having this notion or this concept of light, but it, eventually it's going to burn out. Shine brighter for all to see and glorify God. How's your lamp? How is your lamp? If you're good soil, there will be a harvest of joy in your salvation. And you'll be a lamp for the light of truth. God has set his love on you. You've received the word. You understand it. You desire more of it, and your faith grows. Now burn brighter for him. Your love for the truth is going to be manifest in your handling of it. If you're bad soil, though, that joy will either never manifest or it'll soon disappear. And your lamp may never shine because it may never have been lit by the Holy Spirit of God to begin with. We have a tale of two lights, I suppose you could say. Or at least we have light versus darkness. This is not where you want to be. You want to be lit and you want to burn bright. Be lit and burn bright for Christ. Listen, as lamps for Jesus... We are expected to shine. We reveal hidden truth. As lamps for Jesus, we need fuel to burn. And as lamps for Jesus, we ought to burn brighter with time. How's your lamp? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this time that we've been able to gather around your word. And I just thank you for the reality of it. We thank you that we have truth. We thank you that it stands in contrast with error. I pray, Father, that as Jesus Christ has come into the world, who is the true light, I pray, Father, that we would be, that that we, as having been lit by the true light, that we would burn bright as lamps for Jesus. I pray that we would not be a ashamed of the light that we have. I pray, Father, that we would be uh, bold in just the manner in which we we, uh, live our lives so that people can see a, a contrast between the light that is in us and the darkness that is out there. I pray that you would make us strong by the power of your Holy Spirit to live boldly for you, peacefully for you, consistently for you, so that others can see the light of Jesus within us. Thank you once again for this time, and I pray for your richest blessing on all who are gathered here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.